mercury exposure is uh, associated with age. As age goes up, you have more a higher percentage chance of having detectable amounts of inorganic mercury in this case. So a higher chance that you have chronic exposure. So not only was there an increase in this chronic mercury exposure, but this chronic mercury exposure was at a level that was sufficient to elicit a biological response in the liver, the immune system, and the pituitary. So I looked at those three uh, areas and I looked at biomarkers that indicated function for those three areas and all three areas were associated with this uh, chronic mercury exposure. And most strikingly uh, and most novel finding of this study was the association with luteinizing hormone which is secreted by the pituitary which is also inversely related to chronic mercury exposure. So as chronic mercury exposure went up, the luteinizing hormone level went down. If you suffer from chronic mercury exposure, it seems like there's a bi biological response from the pituitary. At the time, I took luteinizing hormone as a bioindicator of pituitary neurosecretion. And I didn't think about it too much until several years later when I was thinking uh, and discussing my findings with other scientists. Dr. Richard Death in particular, he was working with uh, thyroidoxin and he told me about mercury binding with a high affinity to, uh, to this enzyme that's involved in oxidative stress. And I said, how is it related to luteinizing hormone? And he didn't have any answer. So I, I did a lot of research and I unearthed this study from Science, the journal Science in 1990 that showed that luteinizing hormone is the only hormone with the exact same amino acid sequence which is found in thyroidoxin, which is a high affinity binding target for mercury. This system of looking at epidemiological data and then looking at structural data to see if it confirms your findings, I think is very fruitful. I mean, some people just focus on epidemiological data, they ignore the toxicological data, but if you actually want to understand a disease or, or an exposure effect, you can't just focus on one, one type of analysis. You can't just look at that epidemiology and refute. And, and I've met scientists who do that, um, scientists who, who just focus on the epidemiology. But if the epidemiology doesn't, isn't consistent with the toxicology, isn't consistent with the structural biology, isn't consistent with the biochemistry, then you don't have a, a valid or vital uh, hypothesis. And everything in, in the end is a hypothesis. I have taken steps in this research as in other research to follow uh, the trail beyond just epidemiology. In this case I followed it from the epidemiology to structural biology and what I found was that this luteinizing hormone has a very rare and very potent high affinity binding site and not only that but if you look at the three-dimensional structure uh, it's actually found on this so-called seat belt region which is a very important uh, structural feature of the protein which binds the two subunits together. So effectively uh, uh, mercury binding to this region of the uh, peptide of the amino of, of, of luteinizing hormone uh, in high probability will either affect its bioactivity or may affect its elimination rate but it should have a biological effect. Now that is not known at this point. Um, but what is known is that luteinizing hormone provides a causal mechanism for mercury-associated disease. Luteinizing hormone is in a place where mercury is deposited in the body at a much higher rate than other regions of the brain, at 200 to 300% higher. And luteinizing hormone, besides um, regulating um, androgens or um, sex steroids, you know, estrogen and testosterone, it also is involved in immune regulation inflammation and neurogenesis, the birth of neurons. So it basically the, provides a mechanism for all of the associated symptoms and morbidity associated with mercury exposure and their associated diseases. It, it, has the, uh, it explains the strange connection between, um, between let's say, autism and uh, androgen levels, which uh, if you have an etiology of mercury, why would that be? Well, this explains why it would be, because it's affecting luteinizing hormone. Why is it affecting uh, neurogenesis? Why is it affecting inflammation? Why um, is it affecting fertility? All these questions can be answered uh, through an interaction between mercury and luteinizing hormone. 
So um, I got contacted, someone who read the paper and got very enthused, Dr. Kellerman, and he said he wanted to work with me. He has since done uh, assays that have demonstrated convincingly that mercury does bind to luteinizing hormone with the same uh, or equivalent um, strength as it does to thyroidoxin, which is proven to be bioactively changed by mercury and to bind it almost irreversibly. So at this point, um, and we haven't yet shown whether it's bioactive, but it's almost irrelevant whether it's bioactive because if it is bound to mercury um, almost irreversibly, um, then it can be a bioindicator of chronic mercury exposure. Um, it, can, it can show uh, possibly how much mercury is deposited in the pituitary, how much risk there is for uh, endocrine disease and associated diseases. So uh, that's one possibility. Now, if we do show it is bioactive, that this mercury binding to luteinizing hormone does change the bioactivity, which is what I predict, then it explains this other mechanism where luteinizing hormone becomes a focal, uh, a focal um, link in the uh, causal mechanism that explains mercury exposure and accumulation, deposition, uh, and associated diseases and all these variety of different symptoms. So at this point this is very early in the research and we believe further study is necessary.